I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for uh, this presentation entitled Dementia Types. Uh, today's program is being presented by Providence Life Services. We are a senior living organization with communities throughout Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. My name is Robin Pisak. I am the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Providence Life Services, and I'm so glad that you could all join us today. Uh, before I turn it over to our presenter today, I'd like to cover just a couple of housekeeping topics. Uh, for those of you that will be uh, that are um, in Illinois and will be uh, seeking out the continue the one continuing education unit, uh, what we're asking you to do um, it's for social workers and nurses. Uh, once you are once the program is completed, um, in the next couple of days, you will be getting a survey. Uh, survey link to complete the survey. You'll have a week to complete that survey um, and get it back in. And then uh, within about 30 days, you will get your uh, continuing education credit uh, certificate sent to you via email. We invite your comments and questions for today's program. And at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see two buttons. One is for chat and one is for Q&A. Um, if you think of a question, you are welcome uh, at any time. You can use the uh, either button to type in your question, and we will answer all the questions at the end of uh, today's presentation. Also, this session is being recorded, um, and it will be shared on our website. A uh, link is going to also be provided to you via email. I'm very excited to uh, welcome our presenter, Colleen Sebekbar. Colleen is the owner of Trinity Advocacy Group, which is an organization that provides geriatric care management, professional fiduciary services, and elder mediation. Colleen is a gerontologist and a certified geriatric care manager through the National Association, excuse me, National Academy of Certified Care Managers. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Colleen who will start today's presentation. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Providence Life Services. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, we have, um, I've had the pleasure of doing some other presentations with Providence Life Services, and it's always such a pleasure to partner with them. Um, so thank you very much, Robin and team, for having me. We're going to get started. I'm going to change my slides here so we can get started from the, the slideshow. And as, um, as Robin mentioned, the topic it is really the different dementia types. And what we're going to discover together today is that there's really four major types of dementia. A little bit about me, we're not gonna go into this a whole lot, um, but as, as Robin already mentioned, I own Trinity Advocacy Group. I'm a gerontologist, which is not to say I am a geriatrician. So a geriatrician is to older adults what a pediatrician is to children. A gerontologist is not a medical degree. It is an, an expert in aging from multiple perspectives, including sociology, the biology of aging, psychology of aging, and uh, many different perspectives, economics and ethics of aging. And so that plus my 26 years of serving older adults and their families uh, primarily um, over the last 26 years makes me a gerontologist. So um, I also, I am a certified geriatric care manager and certified mediator through Northwestern University. And I've spent my life truly working, serving older adults. And that started with my own family and has never stopped. I just had this fascination with older adults I, I, um, and vulnerable adults. When we first started Trinity Advocacy Group, I thought, wow, um, you know, I'm going to serve lots of older adults. And what's surprising to me, and maybe not surprising to you, but I'm not just serving older adults, but it's older adults and their families. Many times older adults are now in a caregiving or even parenting situation. Um, sometimes older adults are taking care of dependent adult children, either due to disability, addiction, um, a variety of things, or just plain old, I'm not leaving the house syndrome. So I, will, I think there was a movie about that with Matthew McConaughey called Failure to Launch. So maybe that's why. Um, and, that, and we certainly have seen that as well. So um, we serve as um, that compass many times for our families through geriatric care management and um, will also serve as powers of attorney and guardians and uh, estate 
executors and trustees, that kind of thing. I'm not going to, I don't want this to be a sales pitch. I only bring this up to you to say that it was through this work that I realized how um, prevalent the misunderstanding is about people just really lump this whole idea of what is dementia into one category. And so it became really important to me to really research this topic and come up with some answers because not only was I looking for that, but certainly our clients were being underserved um, through the medical community and the misunderstandings about the fact that it isn't all Alzheimer's. And so it's important to talk about this because when misdiagnosis happens, so do treatment options, then we're not treating the right thing. We're not looking at the right trajectory. And sometimes those underlying causes are also not being treated. They look like dementia, but in fact, they're not a true dementia. Why is it interesting? Well, to me, it's interesting because as you know, the prevalence is certainly here, right? The longer we live, it's very true that the more susceptible we are to this, uh, the major types of dementia, Alzheimer's being the number one dementia type due to age. Um, and we're gonna get into some of those nuances. That's this whole program. Your treatment options, are sometimes different depending on the type of dementia. We have to prepare the workforce. You and I and those we love and those we serve need to be prepared and educated in my opinion on this important topic so you can start to differentiate between these different dementia types. We have to be able to assist our caregivers. I had a woman um, whose husband was misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's disease for 10 years before she got the correct diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia, a very different uh, type of dementia. And so she was rightly going to support groups and hearing all of these people who were really grappling with Alzheimer's. She needed a very different kind of support because FTD is a very different um, trajectory and a di very different disease process. So we also have to expand the research. And in, I am passionate about research because as a gerontologist, the ironic thing about studying aging is that the field of gerontology is very young. It really only started to get recognized as a true discipline in the 1970s. And so research is is just really beginning for so many of the things that are hitting our oldest old population because people just weren't living that long. So let's talk a little bit about this math, uh, myth versus fact. Let's not talk about math. That's definitely not my forte. So myth versus fact. So the myth is that forgetfulness is a normal part of aging. And while it's true that there is a delay in processing, that's absolutely normal for the older adult mind. Those synapses truly are not firing at the pace that they used to. But forgetfulness is many times, it's a symptom of something, something greater. There's also the myth that not everyone has memory problems as they get older. Actually, that's not true. Uh, as a person gets older, they have a at a 50-50 chance of having dementia. The good news here is after age 90, the slide says after age 85 in the exciting breaking news here is that it's actually people over the age of 90. And what we're finding is that this onset of Alzheimer's as our, as our um, most common dementia type is being delayed until age 90, that's exciting news. Also dementia is permanent and there is no cure. And there really are two different types of dementia. And when you think about dementia, um, we're gonna define that a little bit more because we all have this idea of what dementia is. And it's actually, you might be surprised a little bit different than maybe what you've always understood it to be. And there's really two types, reversible and irreversible. So, the definition of dementia is really brain failure. It's the, the, the brain is unable to think, remember, and reason 
and behave appropriately. Now, is it all of those things at the same time? No, not always. Because we've always, we've thought that memory was the primary reason or, or the primary symptom of dementia. And that's simply not the case. That is the case for many uh, or the, the three major types of dementia, but um, three out of four. But really, it is the loss of a person's ability to think, remember, reason, and behave appropriately. And this is very important to the extent that it interferes with a person's daily life and activities. So this Many people live with this inability to really think through, through things and reason um, and remember and behave appropriately, but it doesn't disrupt their daily life and activities. And so there's another diagnosis called MCI or mild cognitive impairment, which by the way, is a risk factor for getting dementia, but it doesn't guarantee dementia. So that's very good news. So mild cognitive impairment uh, many people live with mild cognitive impairment. These are people where you can put post-it notes around and have reminder systems, and that does an adequate job. That really helps them remember to do the things because they just need that visual cue. But And those are people really in the MCI category. But MCI, just like blood pressure um, or a coronary coronary artery disease is a risk factor for heart attack or stroke. MCI is a risk factor of dementia, but it does not guarantee dementia. And I think that's exciting. I think that's really good news because when people get diagnosed with a true dementia, um, that's a different category than MCI. So Alzheimer's disease remains the number one cause, the leading cause of dementia worldwide. And that really came to the forefront here in the United States when our beloved president or beloved for some and maybe not beloved for all, but our uh, president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, succumbed to this disease. And there was some discussion after his presidency ended that he was experiencing either MCI or early stages of a true dementia while still in office. Also, for those of you who remember Dear Abby, um, she was a columnist, a gossip column, not a gossip columnist, uh, a, um, oh, Colleen, um, losing the word. She was an advice columnist. And so people would write her regularly about all kinds of problems. And so one woman wrote into Dear Abby and described what she would define as Alzheimer's disease. And she was talking about her mother and how alone she felt in trying to care for her mother and trying to understand this disease. And so Dear Abby put all, the Alzheimer's Association on the map, so to speak, because she referenced this Alzheimer's Association, which of course we all know as the premier place to really get very credible information. So, um, Dear Abby, you may or may not know, did then later succumb herself to Alzheimer's disease. So I mentioned earlier two categories of dementia, reversible and irreversible dementia. So irreversible uh, dementia really is something that is, um, there's a cause underneath the symptoms, a, a, a direct response or a, a, a direct, you know what, will you excuse me? I'm gonna close my door. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay, my sincere apologies for that uh, interruption. So reversible characteristics mean that this underlying temporary can get condition once it's treated that your brain regains the, those lost functions when this underlying cause is treated. And, and this is where you and I, as advocates and people who uh, serve vulnerable adults need to be very, very well educated because all too often, people are sort of slapped with this dementia diagnosis, which can be damning uh, for a variety of reasons. This uh, a diagnosis maybe follows them in their electronic medical record. And really when things are not 
treated, this underlying cause is not treated, we don't have a reversible dementia. And as importantly, we never treat the actual cause. So you and I need to be really aware of the fact that these, what you see on the screen right now, these common causes of reversible dementia, um, once these underlying causes are treated, you should see a regaining uh, of function for the brain, a, a true baseline. So brain disease is one of those things. Think like mad cow disease or um, encephalopathy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Depression. So untreated or undertreated depression can absolutely look like a true dementia. Because if you don't, if you're depressed and you're not clinically being treated for that, you're not caring about your hygiene. You're not caring about what day it is. You're maybe not taking your medications. Um, also, how about medications? So you may or may not know that there are certain over-the-counter medications there are also prescribed medications, but over-the-counter medications that can create a temporary and reversible dementia, even delirium. Benadryl is a great example. So if you or I take Benadryl and because we got a bee sting or we have seasonal allergies, that's perfectly fine. And something happens for some people in the older adult body, they cannot metabolize diphenhydramine properly, for lack of a better word, um, metabolization. Or So that medication, Benadryl, has a different impact on the older adult brain and creates a delirium that once that medication is stopped can actually bring that person back to to baseline. That's a really important factor. Can you imagine going into an emergency room and you've got white hair and wrinkles and you're speaking gibberish or you are not able to tell anybody the date or what your name is and all of that? And if you had only known that medication that you had taken Benadryl because you were out in the garden earlier today and your allergies are on fire, so you decide to take Benadryl and all of a sudden you don't know where you are. And that's a really important point. If you get into an emergency room, you might be slapped with a diagnosis and get all the wrong treatments. Now, the good news with the medication error in that particular case is you would come to back to baseline pretty fast. That uh, the, the half-life of Benadryl is not that long in the body. I also want you to consider malnutrition and malnutrition includes dehydration. And once you are becoming dehydrated and your electrolytes are off, you can really have dementia type symptoms and you can have forgetfulness, you can have a delayed response, you can have interruption in thinking. Dehydration is really very important factor to malnutrition. Also, you may or may not know that as you and I get older, we start to lose the hues, the blue and green hues in our visual field. And so when you look at a plate of broccoli right now, it might look delightful depending on how you cook it and if you like broccoli. But naturally, as we get older, if we start losing those blue and green, uh, green hues, which is a normal part of aging, suddenly the food, the colorful foods that looked robust at one time lose their they, they lose their colorfulness and therefore it doesn't look as appetizing and so and we also retain our sweet taste buds far the longest and so when people you know I hear a lot of people say well all my grandmother wants to eat is you know sweets well not only is she is that a survival tactic but it is also the thing she can taste and enjoy the most Heart disease, we used to call this coronary artery disease or senility or, you know, that can definitely be a factor in creating reversible dementia. I had a client whose daughter called me and she said, Colleen, I don't know what is going on with my mom. She started sort of slowly losing her memory and, you know, a variety of other things. And I was thinking, oh boy, well, what if this is a true dementia? But best practice, so you know, is to send that person to a neurologist who specializes in neurocognitive disorders, which is what I did. And it took her a few months to get her mom in to see this neurologist who specializes in neurocognitive disorders. But what he was able to identify was that she had a blockage in her carotid artery. And so they cleared out the carotid artery 
and she finally started getting oxygenated blood to her brain and the nutrients that she was missing and she came back to a beautiful and functional baseline. So these are really important factors trauma to the brain. So you've heard of traumatic brain injury. Um, that 15 years ago, if you had a traumatic brain injury, that might manifest itself like a dementia. And in fact, if you are diagnosed with a TBI traumatic brain injury, there may be different interventions for you. Metabolic or endocrine disorders, think thyroid disease, infections for reasons we don't know, urinary tract infections, upper respiratory infections, and the antibiotics to treat those infections um, create for some people um, an exacerbation of a true dementia or dementia-like symptoms until that infection is resolved. And then environmental changes. So I don't want you to be too hard on those people that are moving into you know, these Providence communities. If they're moving in, give them a good solid six months to adapt to that. You know, you were right when you were talking that this might be the beautiful place for them to live, but you have to give them time to adapt. Don't get so worried. I tell families that all the time about this idea of give your loved ones six months to bring that pendulum back to center uh, as they're starting to adapt and adjust. The other thing I would mention is, you know, a lot of times, and, and I have one a client a family right now whose mother lives in community. They, because of COVID, they moved her out of that community. They were very worried about her health and well-being. And she has three daughters, all who are willing to take her for a month at a time, which is lovely to share the uh, load, but completely disorienting to their mom who already has a diagnosis of dementia. So these irreversible dementias, three out of the four are, are progressive. They're degenerative, meaning they're going to get worse over time. And I'm going to show you this um, video because I think you are going to love it. And now it is not allowing me to do that. So let's go back. I apologize. Um, there is this wonderful video. It's a three minute video on what is Alzheimer's disease. And it is really um, the the three minute video, and I'll send that since I wasn't able to show you that today, I'll send that along with the, um, the survey and the, tonight's presentation. It is very worthwhile. It gives a visual review of how Alzheimer's goes through the brain. What does that progression look like in the brain? What are those symptoms? It is so well done and I'm a visual person. And so I have never found a better video that sort of visually helps me understand what is happening in the brain. And just a quick personal story, um, my grandmother who lived with us since the time I was four and would later become my very best friend, um, her husband passed away a month before I was born. And I think that probably created a very special bond from her to me. And I felt that because it was then mutual. She would eventually come, succumb to Alzheimer's disease. So I know a little bit, not just professionally about serving people, but also from the personal perspective, what that looks like for a person that I love and that we serve going through this very painful process is seeing somebody lose themselves over a very gradual period of time. So I don't know what you think of when you think of FTD um, as a hazard of the job, I now think of something else completely, but back in the day, I would think of these beautiful flowers and this guy, you know, this FTD guy delivering flowers. Well, it's not what I think of anymore. I actually now think of frontotemporal dementia. And so those of you who have been around some time in the field, you may have recognized this. We used to call this Pick's disease. And it was called Pick's disease because of um, this physician, Arnold Pick, who first discovered this disease called Pick's disease. And it really represents 10 to 15% of all cases. And FTD is this umbrella uh, diagnosis or umbrella term. There's many different subtypes of FTD. One you may be familiar with is called PPA, and that stands for primary progressive aphasia. 
And that's where that uh, person is, is having a hard time expressing him or herself and also has a hard time sometimes with the written word, both reading it and um, understanding it. So the hallmarks of FTD are people who are afflicted with FTD is they are typically under the age of 65. The onset is usually 40s, between the 40s and the 70s, 45 to 65. And this is very, very commonly misdiagnosed as a psychiatric disorder because people aren't thinking about dementia in the prime of their lives when they're still working. They're still age earners um, or wage earners. And so this affects a person's personality, their behavior, and as I just mentioned, their language. So um, this is a devastating disease to people who are still in the working world there and that maybe are the breadwinners for the family. And so they have these sort of bizarre personality changes that cannot be explained and oftentimes are misdiagnosed with depression, psychosis, and a variety of other things, and it's just not the case. Now, interestingly, memory is not an issue with FTD. Memory is not usually the first impairment with FTD. That is critically important for you and I to know, because again, if you go back to what you thought you knew about dementia and you're like, oh, that's, mem that's memory impairment. No, it isn't, not for every dementia. And this is one of the four major dementia types. So these changes in personality are a loss of empathy. So imagine you're telling your loved one, your spouse perhaps, you know, that you that you're you had somebody very dear to both of you pass away. And your spouse's response was like, oh, thanks for letting me know. And he or she walks on with their day. They just, they lose this ability to empathize. And that would be a personality change uh, for someone experiencing this. A lack of judgment and inhibition, apathy. So lack of judgment, one of the stories that I was told about FTD and it was in a, it was in a webinar that I attended was about a father um, and a mother who took their daughter out and they were camping and he had ha had these brain changes and his wife didn't realize just how impaired he was until they he took his daughter by the hand and they were in this river and the undertow came and in, instead of uh, it started to take the child away and he went um, and took care of himself and brought himself to safety. And um, the wife luckily was able to get the daughter, but that was a, a huge change in his personality and in his judgment that he would save himself, which of course is innate. And yet as a father, he would have before this FTD gone to try to help his daughter survive. A decline in personal hygiene is a hallmark here. Also changes in eating habits habits predominantly overeating and OCD or obsessive compulsive uh, obsessive compulsive disorder um, is FTD is sometimes mistaken for that because what can happen is people get into these repetitive uh, behaviors and so one of my clients would repeatedly shave himself and I mean he would shave himself raw and his wife finally you know had the the idea to cover that um, that razor with something and her husband would still try to shave because they couldn't really keep him from doing that but at least he wasn't you know shaving himself bloody anymore. Oh, and I should mention very importantly that there's an absolute lack of awareness or thinking of behavioral changes. FTD patients have, have no awareness that they are changing at all. You're the crazy one. You're the one who with the problem, not them. You, you're the one who's making, you know, you're probably the person who's taking money out of the accounts. You're probably the one who has um, all of these issues, not them. So there's this absolute lack of insight which is another hallmark of um, mental health. And that's another reason why it is oftentimes misunderstood as a psychiatric disorder. As I mentioned, FTD can have a, a language impact or lock, loss of speech, um, difficulty using and understanding it written in, in spoken language. What is interesting 
about FTD is as it progresses, there is a certain rigidity to the body that happens naturally with the progression of FTD. It starts to affect the the rest of the body, the, the neurological um, symptoms that take place are tremors, rigidity, muscle spasms, uh, poor coordination and difficulty swallowing, muscle weakness, and an overall slowing down. So the client I was telling you about before that would shave just constantly, um, you know, he was, he just had this OCD like symptoms. I had seen him six months apart and I was a marked difference between his ability to put, you know, he was eating a sandwich the first time I met him. The next time I went to see him, he was having soup and the amount of time, I mean, the slowing down was tremendous. It was like somebody turned a dial and just turn down this ability to eat his soup and bring food to his to his mouth was tremendous, um, marked difference. So vascular dementia is another one of these three out of four major types of dementia. So we've covered Alzheimer's, FTD, and now vascular dementia. And next to Alzheimer's, Vascular is the second most common type of dementia. But now what is very interesting about vascular dementia, at least in my opinion, is it is not considered progressive. So let me tell you more about that. So vascular dementia, we do not think of that as a progressive dementia because technically it does not get worse unless you or, the, you or I or the patient has repeated vascular events. Think stroke, uh, think blood clots, think heart attack, these things that might affect the brain. So let's talk about stroke for a moment. And when you think um, vascular, I want you to think blood flow, okay? Blood flow to the brain. And what happens when a person has a stroke in the brain, and I'm simplifying this, not because you can't understand it, just I, I never want to assume what a, what a person's um, you know, level of understanding is with vascular dementia or any concepts we're talking about today. What happens with a stroke is that there's a, there's a bleed on the brain. And what happens is in that part of the brain, um, when, when a stroke happens, that brain suffocates. It doesn't have oxygenated blood anymore. It's, uh, it's not being on that part of the brain then dies. So if the person has a stroke in the frontotemporal part of the brain, then their executive function will be disrupted. They won't be able to, perhaps won't be able to do things that, you know, you and I need to write a grocery list, follow a recipe, balance the checkbook, things like that. That's when your executive function starts to be disrupted. And so if you have a stroke in that part of the brain, we're not expecting then memory, which is housed in a different part of the brain, language housed in a different part of the brain, um, fine and gross motor mo movements housed in different parts of the brain. We're not expecting global deterioration with vascular dementia. We are experiencing and we would expect that if the stroke, ha or, yeah, the stroke happened in the area of the brain that governs executive function, we expect that, that, that that's where the disruption is going to take place unless you have another stroke in a different part of the brain. And then if you have a stroke in a different part of the brain because you never got the cause under control, so your high blood pressure, you weren't taking your medication for that, or you didn't know that you had high blood pressure and you had a stroke and it affected that part of the brain, um, you know, if you don't treat that underlying cause of the vascular disease, you may continue to have these vascular events. And so you have these different, um, you know, dots, so to speak, on your brain of these vascular events. And that is why we don't consider vascular dementia progressive. It happens episodically. And it's no small thing when a person starts to, to survive a stroke or come back from 
a stroke. And cause I've had people say, yeah, but Colleen, I mean, my, my loved one had a stroke and they were paralyzed and they started, you know, getting their feeling back again in their arms and their legs and their speech came back and that's wonderful. But that is not because that part of the brain regenerated. The exciting thing is, is what happened was the brain started to find new neural pathways to make those, to bring back that level of functioning. It's not that that stroke, that area of the brain just all of a sudden came back to life. That's not what happened. What happened pathologically is that the brain started to regenerate new neural pathways to make those things possible again. So as I mentioned, executive functioning difficulties, again, if this, if that vascular event took place where executive functioning is housed in the brain, planning projects, comprehending how much time a project will take to complete, telling stories chronologically, verbally, or in writing is very difficult for people who are experiencing executive functioning difficulties. Memorizing and retrieving information from memory is a struggle. Initiating new activities, retaining information to move forward um, with projects that used to be easy for people no longer become easy or no longer are easy. There are also multiple subtypes of vascular dementia. So just like we talked about with FTD, frontotemporal dementia, that's an umbrella term. There are subtypes under FTD. Vascular dementia, there are also subtypes there. Multi and infarct. Those are, we're, we're probably getting too much into the weeds on this conversation. I'm not gonna go into this an awful lot, but just so you know that um, vascular subtypes do exist. So let's look at the difference for vascular dementia versus Alzheimer's just very, very briefly. Vascular dementia, the onset is, onset is sudden and usually related to an event as I just described. So I was talking about stroke, um, it could be a seizure, it could be um, a variety of interruptions in the brain, but once that stabilizes, the vascular dementia stabilizes or after that event, we don't expect another vascular dementia or um, event to happen unless that underlying cause is not treated. Vascular dementia is often accompanied by physical changes such as paralysis in the inability to speak. The diagnosis is oftentimes confirmed with an MRI because you can see that very clearly on an MRI versus Alzheimer's disease. So where vascular dementia is very, the onset is sudden related to an event, Alzheimer's disease, that is a gradual decline. So when you start asking a person about, if a, if a um, um, an interviewer or a social worker or a physician or a nurse is asking loved ones about, um, you know, when did your loved one start having, when did your husband start having changes? Well, you know what? It was right after his stroke, like, or after his heart attack or some sort of vascular event. That is very different than guidelines, or I'm sorry, than trying to pinpoint an Alzheimer's disease. When did he or she start having changes? Well, you know, that when we were on vacation that one summer, yeah, but then he was still working after that. And then it got a little worse over time. You can't really pinpoint that with Alzheimer's disease. Um, Physical strength with an Alzheimer's patient usually is exceptionally impressive. They, re they, there's no other physical interruption many times with your Alzheimer's patients. They stay physically very robust and agile for a long, long time until much later stages of the disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is global. It, it's a global deterioration. It certainly has a, a, a trajectory that is progressive, but we expect a global de deterioration in the brain versus, as I mentioned, those pockets with vascular dementia. And the diagnos diagnosis is usually made by ruling out other causes. So here's our fourth and final dementia type. And it's called, there, there's some, there's some debate in the neurological community about Lewy body dementia. 
and it is the second most common type of progressive dementia. So Alzheimer's is progressive, FTD is progressive, and Lewy body dementia is also progressive. And if you remember this gal uh, from the Golden Girls, she actually would succumb later to um, Alzheimer's, I'm sorry, to Lewy body dementia. And so what are Lewy bodies? There's some, there's some debate here in the medical community about what comes first, Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's type dementia. And I'm going to talk about the link between these two dementia types in just a moment. But what are these things called Lewy bodies? Well, they're microscopic protein deposits that start to accumulate on the brain and they travel throughout the brain. They sort of, um, they sort of build on each other and they're, they start to make all of these deposits in the brain, sort of litter the brain with these protein deposits. They disrupt the normal functioning of the brain and cause it to slowly start to deteriorate. Um, Frederick Louis was the neurologist who first identified these Louis body deposits. And um, there are really, the, there are some hallmarks of Louis body that we're going to get to in just a second, which I think is going to be really eye-opening. I hope it is for you the way it has been for me. But Louis, da there are two types, as I mentioned, and there's some discussion and debate. Two types of Louis body dementia are dementia with Louis bodies, and that is diagnosed when dementia, dementia, pardon me, is present before, at the same time, or simultaneously, or within one year of onset of motor symptoms. Otherwise, the other Lewy body dementia type is really called Parkinson's dementia and is diagnosed if the onset of dementia occurs a year or more after the onset of motor symptoms. So it's kind of which came first, the dementia, you know, those, those um, the, the loss of brain function, or did this uh, did the tremors and the other Parkinson's, classic Parkinson's uh, signs come first? So which came first is going to determine how your loved one or your patient or your resident is diagnosed. So two, you may or may not know that Robin Williams was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I was a little frustrated by the fact that after his suicide, that the um, media stated that he had Lewy body dementia. Um, while that was not clinically inaccurate, the pathological hallmarks were certainly there upon autopsy for him. The, the misinformation out there in media land about he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, nobody had diagnosed him yet with Lewy body dementia, that we, at least that was part of uh, the reports out there. But the other person that you may know, Michael J. Fox, is sort of the face of Parkinson's disease. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease much, much earlier in his life. And um, his foundation has tremendously helpful resources. So if you have never logged on to Michael J. Fox Foundation, you will find just an unbelievable amount of reputable resources and research dollars that go towards that continued uh, research. So Parkinson's disease, you may or may not know, is a progressive disorder of the nervous symptom system. And it is, um, it, these are classic symptoms are tremors, muscle stiffness, slowness of movement, poor balance, and poor mobility. And this is the classic posture of a Parkinson's disease patient. So the rigidity and trembling of the head, um, the, the swinging of the arms, difficulty oftentimes getting up out of a chair, getting moving, walking. If you wanna spend a good um, eight minutes, find a video on YouTube with Parkinson's disease and music and watch this physical therapist do remarkable things with the Parkinson's patient um, related to music. And we know how powerful music is for memory, but I had never seen it prior to that make such a profound impact for a Parkinson's patient. It was very moving. So I invite you to take a look at that. So Parkinson's related dementia compared to Alzheimer's disease. On the Parkinson's side, again, memory is typically not an issue with the Parkinson's related dementia and even Lewy body, which is why it makes it so difficult to treat 
um, people with Lewy body because their memory is intact, but they have these hallucinations. And hallucinations are classic, classic symptoms for Lewy body type dementia. But memory is not an impairment. And so that those hallucinations are so very real to the patient. And yet you cannot convince them that they're having those hallucinations. However, some of the other disruptions in the brain for Parkinson's or Lewy body uh, dementia are attention and adapting to changes in environment. And there is a the rigidity of the body that is experienced by a Parkinson's patient, in my experience, it almost mi mimics this rigidity of the mind. It, there is this rigidity to any kind of change and it is classic symptoms for people with Parkinson's and Parkinson's dementia. Um, less severe memory impairments, as I mentioned, their ability to impact their um, decision-making is retained much, much longer oftentimes. They do fluctuate more in their cognition, uh, attention, and their ability to do things. So good days, bad days, ups and downs. It's a, it's a moving target oftentimes. Frequent vis visual hallucinations and sleep disturbances. I mean, and when I say sleep disturbances, I'm saying people are waking up from these vivid dreamscapes so convinced that what has happened is so very real, they're still in that dream state when they wake up. And it's sometimes a full day before they can come down. It's so powerful. And the worst part, perhaps, is that the antipsychotic medication that is given to younger Parkinson's patients as a method to relieve their tremors is the very medication that creates behavioral disturbances in later life when that Parkinson's patient is trying to be treated with those very same drugs. So oftentimes patients with Parkinson's are making these terrible choices um, between, you know, do I treat my tremors or do I treat or, you know, or, or do I succumb to these behavioral disturbances? And so that's all the more reason why it's extremely important to have your patients, your loved ones, your clients, your residents see a neurologist who specializes in neurocognitive disorders. And if you have somebody that is experiencing true Parkinson's, what you want to do is have that person see a neurologist who specializes in movement disorders. Because as that person starts to progress through their, their um, trajectory of Parkinson's disease or um, the related dementia, you want that neurologist to be treating those behavioral disturbances and not necessarily a psychiatrist because there is a, that, that brain, that neurological brain or the way the brain is being impacted by those medications is just not the same as somebody with just, you know, who needs uh, behavioral or antipsychotic medication. So I would implore you to make that um, a best practice for you and the people you serve. Other conditions that might cause dementia are things like Huntington's disease. So this is a, a progressive inherited degenerative brain disorder that produces um, physical, emotional, and mental changes, including dementia. And the awful thing about Huntington's disease is that it, as I mentioned, it is inherited and that heredity touches the next generation earlier and earlier and earlier. So some years ago, I had a 21 year old uh, client who was sent to jail a very long story. It was terrible. He was sent to jail. That never should have happened. But this gentleman was in a supportive living facility and um, was having some interactions and had actually been bullied. Anyway, the other resident, the bully resident, decided to press charges, and so which was his right to do. And so my client went to jail. He was in his early 20s. And um, in getting to know him a little bit more, what I what I found out was his father had 
Huntington's disease and he got it in his 40s and his father got Huntington's disease and he was diagnosed in his 60s. And so it's just tragic that this hereditary disease, Huntington's disease just hits people sooner and sooner and sooner if it, if it is hitting the same family member. Kritzfeldt Jacob disease is a rare brain disorder. And you might know this as mad cow disease. It's um, these little tiny holes in the brain. And um, that is another common cause of dementia. Traumatic brain injury. And for those of you who are um, a fan of the 1985 Bears like me, this is our former quarterback or quarterback at the time and Jim McMahon, who would talk about traumatic brain injury. And if you haven't seen the movie Concussion, I implore you to watch that. It's so interesting. And so what, what is sometimes created by repeated traumatic brain injuries, concussions for our NFL players and many others with contact sports. And what Jim McMahon described was this encephalopathy there's a drain that they can put in the brain and it's a port and they can drain some of this, these toxins off the brain. And he described it, Jim McMahon did, because he suffers with this as a flushing of the toilet, just like when the, when the toilet was flushed or when the, these, these um, fluids in the brain are taken out of his brain through this flushing that he finally felt like, oh, he was clear headed again. And so this is the, TBI that these, you know, these things can be treated sometimes. And one other area that I really, really want to talk to you about is called, it's a syndrome called Korsakoff syndrome. And I want you to be aware of this because it's strictly speaking, not a dementia, but it's called oftentimes an alcohol related dementia. This is something that many people succumb to after years and years of abusing alcohol. And what's exciting about this disease or the syndrome is once a person stops drinking and they must stop drinking and they are treated with medical doses of thiamine and B12. And as I mentioned, cessation, good nutrition. I have had multiple clients who have been found in squalor, um, living in squalor, drinking themselves to death who have been sort of brought out of that environment, treated properly, who have graduated to out of, um, you know, needing absolute 24 hour skilled nursing care over a, two to three years is what I've typically found into assisted living, doggone near independent living and they've recovered. And I just think that that's so exciting. We're getting pretty close to the end of our time. I did want to leave for uh, time for uh, questions and comments. I just wanted you to know that it used to be that with regard to Alzheimer's disease, that we could never find a diagnosis until it was time of autopsy. Um, that's not the case anymore. There are some exciting things happening, blood tests coming down the pike. Um, also, an MRI never used to be an option. And in fact, what people are finding is that an MRI is um, a possibility that we can put dye in the body, look at the brain, and there may be pathological um, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease specifically showing plaques and tangles of the brain. Now that's very exciting that we have that test available to us. The downside is Medicare doesn't cover it. But the other piece of that is what we don't know is how to cure this thing called Alzheimer's. So even though plaques and tangles might be pathologically evident, um, in the person's brain. Number one, that doesn't necessarily mean they are going to have symptoms of Alzheimer's because what we know from research is that upon autopsy, people riddled with plaques and tangles in their brain, one third of them have never had memory loss. They've never had these symptoms of Alzheimer's. So it begs the question, do you want to know if you might be one of that, you know, 30% that's never going to experience those changes in your behavior, in your memory, et cetera. So there's hope. Um, I am excited that back in 2012 and by, the, uh, by 2025, the national plan to address Alzheimer's disease, the only downside of that um, title to me is that what 
it, it should really be the national plan to address dementia. Because the more we keep talking about Alzheimer's, although we've made it recognizable because we keep referring to Alzheimer's, as you've learned tonight, it's not just Alzheimer's. There are four major types of dementia and you really must know those differences. So anytime somebody says to me, oh, my loved one has been diagnosed with dementia, typically I follow up and I say, what type of dementia? And I'm always so happy when I hear that that person has been given that differential diagnosis because that tells me a lot about what um, kind of treatment options that person may have. And let me be very clear. There aren't any treatment options that have shown much promise in so far as medications, but there are non-medicinal medications that have shown some promise. And when I'm talking about our music therapies, virtual reality, uh, reading, time slips, all of these interventions that just really do improve the quality of life for a person with dementia, regardless of type. If you have the time, I strongly, strongly encourage you to watch the documentary called Alive Inside. This would be a wonderful um, time for you to spend with your colleagues, um, for the communities who are on the phone today or on call today. I strongly encourage you to um, watch Alive Inside with your staff if you're looking for a way to um, support your families have them watch this. This is all about music and memory. The awakening that these, that these people have is truly profound. Um, some other movies that really are very good at talking about these issues related to dementia and how different people have handled it is Glenn Campbell's I'll Still Be Me, phenomenal movie. Also Away From Her, a documentary about a woman who goes into a memory care center. Um, she asks her husband to put her in this memory care center and she grapples and so does he uh, about the change in their marriage and how this has really changed their marriage. She ends up falling for a guy in the memory care center. It's heartbreaking for him, but these are really things that people grapple with. And as I just mentioned, alive inside. We're at the end of our time. Um, and I'm at the end of my presentation, but I, I want to invite Robin to come back on the screen. I'm going to stop my screen share and just ask Robin if you have anything that other people wanted to ask or contribute. Yes. So thank you so much, Colleen. What a what a wonderful presentation. The information I took so many notes on. Um, some of these great resources that you've provided to all of us, I think to be able to serve our, um, our, our folks that we work with, um, with, with, such, with such great information. So I appreciate it very much. Very um, I know we have a couple of questions that are out there. Um, before we go to that, I just wanna thank our, our sponsoring Providence Life Services communities that have put on this presentation in coordination with you today, Colleen. So um, as I mentioned previously, we uh, Providence Life Services has a 12, uh, eight senior living communities, 12 communities in, all, in total with our skilled nursing uh, facilities, but uh, we serve uh, the states of Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. Um, and represented here today are, are six of our uh, communities that are participating in this program uh, that, that are hosting this, and that is Emerald Meadows, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's an assisted living and memory care community. Our Park Place of Elmhurst uh, Health and Wellness Community, which is in, in Elmhurst, Illinois. Royal Atrium Inn is an assisted living community in Zeeland, Michigan. Our Saratoga Grove Community, which is an assisted living and memory care, as well as independent living community located in Downers Grove. Um, as well as our Victorian Village community that's in Homer Glen and they offer independent assisted living and memory care at that community. And finally, our Village Woods community, which is located in Crete, Illinois, and they offer independent living and assisted living. So thank you all uh, for hosting this program today. Um, it looks like we've got a few questions here and uh, we, uh, we respectfully um, you know, understand that if, if there are maybe some of you on this call that need to jump off and uh, just know that this program is being recorded and will be sent to you so that if you do have to jump off, um, we'll still be able to get you this, this portion of, of the presentation sent to you. So I'm gonna go to our first question. And <clears throat> the question is, 
is FTD hereditary? Oh, good question. No, there's no, there is no um, evidence to support that FTD is hereditary. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, are there medications to treat these illnesses? I think you touched on that a little bit maybe, but um, the uh, participants question centers really more around Lewy body dementia and medications to treat that. So, um, so to, there are two medications, three medications that are on the market today that are really aimed at slowing the progression of progressive dementia types. And so what we know is those do not work in for everybody. And um, we also know that they only have a lifespan of about three years if they do, if they do help at all. And so um, part of the push that I mentioned earlier um, is to find those medical interventions or those medication interventions, but there's been over 200 failed attempts, uh, clinical trials to try to treat these um, dementia symptoms. With regard to Lewy body in particular, um, if we're talking about the hallucinations, is there anything to help that? Sometimes you can get um, a medication that will help more with the anxiety that's related to hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, which is sometimes part of this is, um, it's extraordinarily difficult to treat auditory hallucinations. Um, the thing to remember really is trying to bring that person with Lewy body dementia back to your reality or my reality is, is not recommended. I've got a client right now who sees people daily in her family room and um, it's terrifying for her. I've had people, bolt, you know, every night before they go to bed, push their dresser in front of their door because the people outside their door are going to come in. It's very real mm -hmm. for them. So to go with them and, you know, really come alongside them and support them and just say, God, that must be so scary, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and try to get them seen um, by, you know, because memory is not the, the problem there. So to have them talk with somebody, a psychiatrist or a psychologist who specializes in dementia care is um, so helpful. Right. Thank you for that. Um, there's another question here. The question is, um, earlier you had mentioned about when you talked about vascular dementia and that typically it doesn't get worse unless there's another episode and you, you uh, referred to the building back of some neural pathways. Um, so with that potential, is there, is there any evidence to show that vascular dementia could be reversible? Wow, that's a great question. For a true dementia to be diagnosed, Remember, we have to go back to that initial definition of dementia, meaning you have interruption in multiple parts of, you know, thinking, uh, thinking, reasoning, memory, and uh, appropriate behavior. And so if those things impair a person's life, um, daily life, then, then that would be qualified as a true dementia. If a person has a stroke, of course, they can always get to that point of, well, I shouldn't say always, there's, there's that window where they can regain those neural pathways. But if after a certain period of time, the possibility of them regenerating parts of the brain after, a certain, and it's different for everybody. I keep wanting to say six months, but I, I want to stop shy of that because it's so different. Mm. Um, once that time has passed, the likelihood of then that being reversible is, is very, very, very unlikely. So uh, miracles can happen, but <laughs> clinically that would be, that would be uh, very unlikely. Thank you. Um, well, it looks like that's the end of our questions for today. Um, Colleen, again, our sincere appreciation for this excellent program. Um, I want to remind everybody that we will be sending you out the slides for this program. I believe, Colleen, you're yes. sending that out to everybody so they'll have it as well as the, 
the survey will go out. So um, if you could give a little bit of time for Colleen to get that out to you, you'll, uh, as a reminder, you'll have a week to complete that um, survey. And uh, then hopefully, you know, within around 30 days or so, you'll, you'll have your uh, certificate sent to you in the mail. Uh, actually, is it in the mail, Colleen, or is it uh, via it would, email, it do you would, know? Typically it's email. Okay. Unless, and yes. So you're going to respond to the um, survey and you're going, we're going to ask you to identify your um, email address in there and then we'll send those directly to you. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us again today. We wish you all a wonderful uh, rest of your evening and thank you for all of the work that you do to serve seniors in your areas and we wish you a very safe and happy holiday season as well. Thank you. Thanks, Robin.